Um, so raise your hand if you know something about category theory. Uh, keep your hands up for a second. Just keep them up, keep them up, keep them up. So um, now keep your hand up if you think that you could explain category theory to somebody else. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, uh, you're more confident than I am. Um, I have a feeling that it's very hard to explain category theory to someone who's never encountered it, much less uh, any given programmer. So on that note, welcome to my talk, Category Theory for People Who Can't Be Bothered to Learn It, or Category Theory for Programmers <laughs> for Programmers. <laughs> if, if you're already a master category theorist, uh, you might be a little bit bored by this, so I did a talk last year. This is me, by the way. Um, you can find me everywhere with that, but I don't do much anymore on social media. So, I mean, you can like tweet me if you want, but I won't respond. I don't look at it anymore. It's a cesspool, guys. Get off Twitter. Like, really, what are you doing with your lives? Um, but GitHub is okay, or I guess GitLab now, right? <laughs> that's, called, that's called topical humor. Uh, so this is me last year at this conference when I thought I would get 10 people to show up and learn about lambda calculus, and it was uh, maybe fewer people than this, but still a lot. And it seemed like there was a need for, wow, that's very dark. I'll uh, use a filter next time. It seemed like there was a need for at, like super beginner level content. And I think everybody who comes here and thinks about giving a talk always feels like they're not qualified, they feel extremely intimidated, they don't have anything to say. Does this seem like a familiar feeling for people? I don't, yeah, okay, even you. Um, yeah, yeah. So I think I felt that given last year's, I don't know, quasi-success, I got some good feedback, um, I would attempt something even a little bit more ambitious than just lambda calculus. And one of the reasons I wanted to do category theory is, um, and again, you may have found yourself in this situation, you come to a functional programming conference, and you suddenly find yourself, you may be even a professional programmer, and suddenly you're surrounded by people talking about category theory all the time. Functors, monads, con extensions, profunctors, whatever. And it's like they're speaking this secret language. And, and it can seem like they're being really uh, obnoxious and, and exclusionary, and, um, and your feelings probably like, how do I become like them? And honestly, honestly, you don't need to learn category theory to be a functional programmer. I think it just tends to attract certain kinds of people. Maybe the people who are attracted to functional programming are attracted to category theory. Um, if you like patterns, you know, if you like uh, puzzles, or you like the sort of uh, the, 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 the elegance that you get from a nice solution to something, then I suppose you might enjoy category theory. But it's, it's, a, it's a very deep field. There's a lot to it that is not relevant, I think, to programming, at least not in an obvious way. Uh, I certainly don't know most of it. In fact, in preparing for this talk, I did my best to condense all of this material into some like, extremely basic concepts. And you may already know all of them. We're not going to go very far with this stuff. This is, the assumption here is that you know nothing about category theory. Um, maybe a little bit about, do you guys know Haskell? A little bit? Raise your hand if you know a little, a little Haskell. Okay, so I have some exercises. And if you know Haskell, they're going to seem extremely trivial, but this is just a, a conceptual uh, enterprise here. So just to make this perfectly clear, because I don't want anyone to be bored or disappointed. I mean, I think the jokes will be okay. The content, you know, you decide for yourself. Uh, this workshop is not for category theorists, right? So people who already are doing this at a very high level, uh, unless you're specifically here to support me. So if you're one of, if you're one of these people, then <laughs> you probably don't need this stuff. Um, the inside jokes, by the way, uh, are for me. <laughs> also, professional Haskell developers, you might find this stuff a little bit trivial. Um, if that is you, though, you're in luck. There are probably people in here who have had no experience with category theory at all. Maybe, maybe raise your hands. I don't know. The people who have like total beginners, like FP beginners, category theory beginners, whatever. Okay. So I assume the rest of you are here for the jokes. Um, 
I don't know everything about category theory, certainly not Haskell, and I'm hoping that this can actually be kind of a little bit interactive. Uh, it can be a discussion. It's a workshop. I don't really want to talk for two hours. Lord knows I can. Uh, please don't let me. So Q&A is good. I probably can't answer all of your questions, but even better, I want to try and get you to like maybe talk to each other. There will be a few opportunities for that. And then, you know, questions are fine, but so are observations. I think we can all learn from each other. This can be an opportunity for group learning, not just me uh, doing a show. So uh, here are some professional Haskell developers. Again, the inside jokes are for me. Uh, smart people who already understand the Oneida lemma. Uh, that's the Oneida lemma. Raise your hand if you understand the Oneida lemma. Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> um, this, is, this is useful if you really want to understand how lens works, I suppose. Uh, I don't understand this. The thing about category theory is you have to sit down and do a lot of work, practically graduate level work. Um, in order to really get the advanced stuff. And uh, it can get very abstract and seem completely irrelevant very quickly. So I don't necessarily recommend that you, you do it. That's why we're concentrating only on fundamentals today. And finally, this talk is not for anyone looking for practical applications, particularly of things like adjunctions, con extensions, ends, coends, pre-sheaves, boost field localizations, day convolutions, fibers, Tanakian dualities, tensor products, comonads, strong lax, monoidal functors, limits, cones, by categories. F algebras, co algebras, bi algebras, higher dimensional categories, groupoids, localizing, subcategories. You know, I wish I had made some of these up. <laughs> these are all real things. In fact, what I should have done was just plant a fake one. I like Tanakian dualities because it sounds like something from Star Trek. Do you know what a Tanakian duality is? Good. Fi finally, finally something. Um, practical applications of category theory are. <laughs> Possible? I mean, there are always things that you can point to and say, here's an example of some kind of categorical concept in action. Um, one of the problems is that category theory generalizes so much of mathematics and knowledge that you can almost make a case for anything being, exa being an example of category theory. And then what happens is you spend more time trying to figure out what the categorical definition of something is than you are doing any kind of practical work. So I think really this is interesting from a conceptual point of view more than anything else. It's a way of thinking. Uh, you're not necessarily going to find programs from this material. Uh, however, if anyone has ideas about that, I'm more than willing to hear it. So goals, define category theory and its most important concepts. Uh, I will attempt. Discuss the relevance of CT to programming. Practice abstract thinking in concrete terms. Avoid getting into the weeds. So category theory is relevant to programming to some extent. Um, there are some correspondences between, let's say, category theory and uh, Haskell, uh, functional languages specifically. But uh, category theory is much more subtle than uh, programming. Uh, programming has to be very precise, right, because you want actual results from your programs. Category theory, um, it, it has allowances. Because it's mathematics, it has allowances for things being fast and loose sometimes in ways that, that we can't be. And so there are always opportunities, no matter what you say about any categorical concept, for someone to say, yeah, but, da, 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 you know, the yeah, but people who like to yeah, but you to death. And have you ever been yeah, butted in a meeting or something? <laughs> Raise your hand if you've been yeah, butted. Yeah, it's real pleasant, right? So I, hand waving a lot of details that I'm just not going to mention because uh, that would be like a six-day workshop or a multi-day workshop, and it's just not important. If you really want to learn this stuff, there are lots of impossible-to-read books available at your local library. They're just mostly diagrams, of which I'm going to draw some, but maybe not so many, especially now that, like, I feel like once I draw diagrams on these boards, they're going to stay there. So I don't know. We do our best. So what is category theory? Um, I think I'd like to defer this question a little bit because if you read any definition of category theory in a mathematical book, it is not very satisfying. Um, last year, I proposed this question, you know, what is functional programming? This is also not easy to explain to people. I mean, you just say it's programming with functions. I mean, category theory is what? A theory about categories. And what is a category? Well, these things are so general, they're hard to define. You can define them kind of by what they're made of, and that's about it. I will come back to this. 
I thought we would actually start with a discussion. This is an audience warm-up opportunity. What is a function? I think this is a much more interesting and much more profound question. Um, and I think there are different ways of looking at what a function is. I have some ideas of my own. I rely on notes for this kind of stuff. But I'm kind of curious to hear from the audience some ideas. What is a function? It seems like a, maybe a trivial question, but I think it's an important one for, get, for getting into what category theory is all about. And by the way, if this seems a little bit elementary, this is also practice for explaining it to other people when they ask you. So maybe that's a goal, right? We finally get at, come out of here able to talk about this with normal people. Like usually, like, oh, I'm going to this talk. What's the talk on category theory? And then like the look on their faces. Anyway, what is a function? How it, Translation from a domain to a codomain. Okay. Okay, uh, I'll just write some of these down. God, I'm really going to bury myself with these boards. Oh, I can flip them around maybe. Okay, so translation, translation from a domain. What's a domain? It's too subtle. Huh? Your writing is too subtle. I know, but I, these boards are very small. <laughs> I can let you come up and take photographs if it helps. <laughs> anyway, I'm just writing down what he said. Translation from domain to codomain. What's a domain? Uh, collection. I'll let you get away with it for now. Okay. <laughs> Translation from domain to codomain. Okay, and someone said something. Yeah, one set to another. Is probably... One set to another. Mapping, okay. Mapping from one set to another. I will accept that. Um, so we have domain and codomain, and now we have sets. Uh, what else? How else can we look at? Yeah. I think, if I can paraphrase the mathematical definition, uh -huh. it's if you give it some input or whatever it is, you're going to get something back. Mm -hmm. You're always going to get only one answer, and I think it's always the same answer. So like mapping from some input to an output, a single output, and it's the same one no matter how many times you get. That's like a computational way of thinking about it a little bit? OK, so um, I'll just maybe make that smaller. So one. Think of it as a black box, right? If you push one input to one. Button, something happens. Uh, I, like, I, like a black, I like black box, actually. This is, yeah, or abstraction. Maybe, especially if we're thinking about lambda calculus kinds of abstractions where we can hide functionality inside. This is like redundant, right? You can hide functionality in a function and not worry about it. That's fine. Uh, other ideas, other words for what a function is? It can be even simpler than this. Like you could say arrow, right? Just the arrow itself. Uh, this will this will be more relevant later, right? But we say, what is a function? Well, it's like an arrow from something to something else. Um, sometimes we could say this is also a graph. I guess you could say that. Any other ideas? Translation from one type to another. One type to another. How is that different than domain to codomain or set to another set? It's just another way. I mean, it's another way of saying the same thing. Um, well, actually, tell me, tell, me about, tell me about translation. What do you mean by translation? Well, basically mapping. But if you don't what is mapping? Exactly. So translate, yes, using synonyms, basically, instead of. Well, it's OK. I'm just, we're like exploring. Like, what does it mean, right? Did you have a hand up over? Yeah, you consider a function to be just a set of ordered pairs, like a mapping style. Yes, uh, uh, yes, I like this one. This is also one of the ones I was thinking of. Um, set, set of pairs. We could say a function from A to B is really just a pair of things, A and B. Yeah, this is totally fine. Or we can say maybe relation. I think this is kind of a mathematic term. My, my writing is getting bigger as I go down the board, I see. <laughs> So, I mean, this is maybe more like a relation because we think of a function as something that does something else. Um, maybe like a set of pairs is more like a, like a product where you get like A, a and B, like A acting on B or, or something acting on A and B, I guess. I don't know. Uh, relation is like more general. 
Uh, we think I, in terms of computation because we're programmers, so we always like to think of this like, I don't know, this dynamics of something from A going to something of B. But really, it's um, just a relationship between A and B that you could create as a lookup table, right? Um, if you have, I mean, and of course you know that if you have pure functions, you can memoize them, right? So if you have some uh, lookup table, I don't know, and they're both, you're just like, I don't know, flipping them around or something. You types oh, I'm going to get to types. <laughs> yeah. No, no, go ahead. Uh, 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 okay, so this is similar to just like a Cartesian product, that kind of idea. X, Y, and then there's some function, or A, B, or whatever, like that. It's very, you want, you want a squiggle, you want me to draw a squiggle, or, like, does that, is that good? Okay. Um, so, okay, these, these are all fine. Uh, another idea is, um, an image of something. All right. Yeah. I, I can't hear you. We're gonna yeah we're gonna get to partial versus total as well. I'm just doing like very very generic stuff right now. Um, so <clears throat> you can also think of a function as, as taking an image of something. So let's say, um, very broadly speaking, you have some, we're doing sets right now, not, not categories. So this is just one way of looking at it. And uh, this is, I guess we'll call this B, and I'll, I'll make A over here is this. So this is, um, and one idea, right? You can take an image uh, of A in B, right? This kind of thing. It's uh, not quite a subset exactly. When you say mapping, this is, this is what you mean. Uh, you can also think of it as maybe naming a property B and then having some kind of selection. So I suppose this would look kind of like this, uh, I have, I don't know, some elements. I don't know what elements are. Actually, I should be a little bit better about the elements. I don't know, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And um, maybe this is taking some, uh, I don't know, what can we say? Uh, American politicians to political parties or something. And there are, I don't know, there are more than two political parties or more than three. Let's just say you can, let's say there are three political parties. You can kind of pretend that a function is kind of like a sorting of elements. This is just like a way of looking at it. Uh, I'm determining like some property of items in A by B. So these are all just different sorts of ideas. Also, um, what did I say about, uh, we didn't talk about uh, product, product of two sets. Did someone say product of two sets? I think I was kind of like mentioning product of two sets. This is why I wanted like a really big whiteboard. Um, I guess I don't need to write this down. So you can think of some function from A to B as the product of two sets, A and B, where, where B is just the subset. B is a subset of the product of these two sets, A and B. Um, also, you can think of some function let me use, uh, I don't know, capital letters here, right? If you're used to thinking about these things in, um, in terms of their cardinality, a function from A to B has the cardinality B to A. So there are this many possible functions from A to B. There are like B, B to the A, this many numbers. And this actually turns out to be um, the power set of, um, of your elements. So I don't know. There's like lots of different ways of thinking about these things. And now I'm probably not going to be able to erase the board. I don't know. Fintan, can you try to erase the board? <laughs> Thank you, best friend. So.
So the way I like to think of functions at the level of uh, sets, if it's going to be useful for thinking about category theory and for talking to other people is uh, as something that is structure preserving. I think this is probably the biggest takeaway that you can have if somebody asks you what category theory is, you can say that it has something to do with structure. How are you doing that? It's amazing. Structure, structure preserving maps. I mean, I think map is a fine word. So what you're preserving is uh, some aspect of A in B. He's already erased my, uh, my little image idea. It's okay. So this, this structure is being preserved by the arrow, by the mapping. And the structure preserving aspect of the arrow, it is, it, that's what's important to us. Um, as programmers, we want things to be structure preserving. I mean, this is in particular for functional programming, right? If you're doing other kinds of programming which don't worry about preserving structures, you have like some like background against which you're programming where you can maybe stick values and access those values from inside your functions. Then you don't have abstractions. You don't have black boxes. You don't really have these structure preserving maps. And the, like I said, this is still at the level uh, of sets. Um, Finton mentioned domain and codomain. So this idea of image, sometimes um, you'll hear the word range. Um, you've probably heard like this distinction between codomain and range. So the image is sort of like the, the range of the function and the image is what we're concerned with. Codomain is any, any value that you could possibly have um, would be in the codomain, whereas the, the range is actually what you get when you, when you do this mapping from A to B. Um, I think I'm moving through this stuff very quickly. So if there are like questions or comments at any point, yeah. Another uh, thought I have for function is that it's a dependency. So you can say if you have a function from A to B, B is a value that depends on A. Yeah. Um, I've heard this expressed somehow like, is there a way of, of, of uh, saying the same thing but using the word parameterized? Yeah. Yeah, like B is like somehow parameterized by A or um, it like varies according to A somehow. Or um, A, A names like some property of B, something like this. Yeah, you could say that A is an index of B. A is an index of B, yeah. Yeah, these, these are all completely um, relevant. Cool, thank you. Um, I think we should move next into uh, types of functions while we're still in the world of sets. So uh, we have these. Injective, surjective, and bijective. And in particular for newer people, an injective function. So let me draw some, some set here. If you're doing a two hour talk, use a whiteboard. Because then you don't have to feel like you're gonna run out of time. But you know you should you know come prepared with uh, humor as well uh, about yourself. So do this little function. Da, 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 da. One, two. I'll do one more. Okay, so these are, these are three functions. And maybe some of you know this already, so I don't know. Um, what kind of function is this among these three? In injective, why is it injective? Hmm? Yeah, so. Yeah, so we have one-to-one -one mappings from the first set to the second set. Uh, what about this one? Is this injective? Yes. Right? So starting in the domain, we have one and only one arrow to one and only one element in the codomain, right? So injective. Also injective. What about this one? Sur surjective. Why? Yeah, so sometimes we say onto, right? So every, every element in the codomain is covered by some function 
in the uh, domain. I mean, possibly by more than one. This is OK. So, sir, this is like, you know that fancy kitchen store, sir la table, like on the table? So, yeah, on, onto. So, covering. It's a good mnemonic. Injective. I don't know, you're injecting each thing. I, I don't know if there's like a, ver a valuable way of remembering that one. One to one is injective. Um, but we have a third one, bijective. Which one of these is bijective? Yeah, top one, bijective. Why? Why is it bijective? Huh? Well, don't, don't, don't get ahead of me. Yeah, everybody is saying correct things. Um, that's what I was looking for. It's, it's like the Socratic method, right? <coughs> it's, um, it is both injective and surjective at the same time. Uh, and then, therefore, what? What were people saying? You can actually get arrows back the other direction for free. And we call this what? Reversible. Yeah, OK. Isomorphism, yeah. Uh, in part, I think I've homo more. Do I have yeah isomorphism? Iso meaning something like isomorphism meaning like equal shape, I guess. They're not equal in value. There's no meaning of equal in value, but they're equal in shape. You can like go back and forth between them, so they they kind of have the same information in a way. I think I saw someone's hand. Surjective means that for every element in the domain, well, sorry, let me go to the codomain. Uh, every, uh, every element in the codomain is, is covered. There's some function to that element, right? So there's nothing left that's not mapped to. This one is not surjective because we have these, we have these extra elements. So injective, starting with the domain, right? Every element has an arrow from that element to some element in the codomain. Co uh, no, they're different. So uh, codomain, I had that picture before. So I could have some function. Yeah, you're going you're gonna to have to do this again. <laughs> so I, I have some function from A to B. And I have uh, some elements like here in this. And I have some elements here. But I also have some other elements, right? And uh, the mapping of this function is actually taking some image of A in B, right? This thing is the range. Oh, okay. So it's the, the range. So the is superset? This thing is a codomain. Okay. Cool. So this is everything it could possibly be. Like, let's say B is, you know, if B is int, this is all of the ints, I guess. Um, this is that set of ints that can be produced by this function. I mean, if this is a function that produces only even numbers or something. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a real problem with this, the first category there. We can, like, just assign. With this? The sine curve. Mm -hmm. You can map to the sine curve, but you can't go the other way. So how does that fall into the scheme? Uh, I don't know. I'm not a, I'm not a mathematician. Oh, I'm like the bottom. The, the bottom okay. Yeah. It would be this one, then. I mean, this, this, this what? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, here, here's my way of getting out of that question. This works for things for which it works. <laughs> if, you, if you can get here and it's a one-to-one -one mapping, then you should be able to. The answer to the question, a sine wave is a subjective function because there's. It's not subjective. It's not injective or injective. Oh, OK. It's not injective or certain. So what is it? <laughs> it's injective. So it's like this. You can't go back though. Yeah. Maybe it's like this. Yeah. You combination of that. Some more elements mapping to one. You get a sign of more than one quantity going to the same one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And now I know what you're talking about. All right. Yeah. You can have functions that are. I mean, you can have like many, many elements all mapping to one thing, right? This is. This is okay. Yeah, and then 
Anyway, this is like math stuff at the level of values, and we're going to abandon this shortly. Anyway, this is just some basic, basic terminology. Um, I think we're probably, as functional programmers, aware of the difference between uh, to total and partial functions, right? I mean, this is a, these are all total functions, right? Because I have arrows from every element to every element. If I have some function, <coughs> like, like this, this is a partial function. Why is this a partial function? Yeah, why is it bad? Exception. Why is it bad for programmers? No one in the video will ever hear this, but I, I want the uh, audience at home to know that they're all correct. Uh, what happens if we get this input, you know? Your program blows up in, t in terms of programming. So, I mean, uh, there are ways of dealing with, with partial functions. You can actually, you can map them to kind of like dead values, I guess. Um, but uh, for the most part, we, we want to avoid them as much as we can. What we really like are, are these things, isomorphisms, so you can go back and forth, and, oops, and uh, homomorphisms. Homomorphism at the level of set is what is referred, is when I say structure-preserving map, homomorphism. You can just think of a homomorphism, same shape, as a synonym for function. When we move up into category theory, everything, uh, well, when we talk about arrows and functions, we're generally talking about homomorphism, so we don't even say homomorphism, we just say, ho uh, we just say morphism, because homomorphism becomes redundant at that level. So um, I have a little, uh, I have some exercises now. These are uh, dead simple. So if you have a Haskell environment, you should load it up now. Um, actually, this stuff is on GitHub, but I think it's so simple you can just type it out quickly. I mean, it's actually so simple it's trivial. But what I want you to do is uh, find a neighbor and become friends with that person and do this together. It is not going to take you that long. C. <laughs> I'm just waiting for the noise to die down. <laughs> um, I'm trying to fit this on one screen so you can see it. So we have uh, two. Two, uh, two very simple uh, data types, day and lunch. And uh, these are just sets of things, mapping from one to the other. Like I said, this is just dead simple. This is when you need to explain this to other people. Here's an easy kind of example. And I have some functions operating on these data types. And for the first one and the second one, I think these, these are all we're going to, OK, let me see. Um, actually, I can fit all three of them. So what kinds of functions are they, first of all? And then for the second one, make it into a partial function, a total function, an injective function, a surjective function, and a bijective function. It won't really be that hard. You can also find this um, on, on GitHub if you, if you really want to download it. But I think this stuff is very simple. Can you actually, is that big enough to see? Oh. Big, uh, bigger, OK. Uh, yeah, uh, under my name, SJ Syrek, SJ, S-Y-R-E-K, slash presentations, slash category theory. In my imagination, I thought that this would be good enough, so I didn't share a link in advance. You're right to shake your head at me. So this is, uh, this is audience interaction time. Just discuss this with each other. It should only take you a few minutes at most. What kinds of functions are they? Why? And then... For this function, what lunch, make it total, partial, injective, surjective, bijective, isomorphic. 
Write an inverse, actually. That would do that as well. Write an inverse function. I think this should take about five minutes at the most. Uh, OK, so this first function, lunch today. What kind of function is this? Maybe like raise your hand because it's too many people in here. Yes. Yeah. No, I did that was the answer because you wanted to raise your hand. Ah, OK. What kind of function is this? Yeah. This is like? Lunch, lunch today, sorry. What kind of function is lunch today? It's just injective. Like, uh, lunch today? Yeah. It's just injective and it goes on to and then, no, not, not on to. Well, what, what does it map to what? Is it injective? So it only maps onto the so covers the, 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 the whole pool. Yeah. It's not yeah. Injective. You think it's injective? No. You don't think it's injective? So what is it? So what is one of the other thing? Subject. Subject. Yeah, raise your hand if you think it, yes. Yeah. Why is it surjective? Yeah, okay. Um, moving on to, yeah, so I hope everybody understands we have two possible values in the codomain, false and true. <coughs> and we're mapping Saturday to false, and we're mapping everything else to true, like this huge bunch of arrows mapping to true. So it's, it's not injective, because injective means one to one, right? And we can't go back, so it's certainly not going to end up a, an isomorphism. But we do cover both false and true. Uh, if for whatever, whatever reason I got rid of that, right, we'd have a, a partial function that is not injective, not surjective. Well, maybe it's injective, but it's a partial function not surjective. Uh, what lunch? What kind of function is this? Again, hands. Yeah? It's not a function. Not a function? Uh, well, what kind of function does that make it? Partial. Yeah, partial function. This is a partial function because Saturday does not map to anything. So how can we make this uh, a total function that is um, let's say surjective, but not, not injective, just surjective, but a total function. Total and surjective. Yeah. <laughs> just make something up. Saturday to pizza? <laughs> it can't be surjective because it's missing burger. We have nothing to match the burger, so there's something on the table so that, uh, that is left over. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. We can map Saturday to burger. Now, well, now it's actually injective and surjective, right? So I don't know if we can make this a total function and surjective, unless someone can think of a way. Get rid of salad. Yeah, get rid of salad. <laughs> 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 okay, we get rid of salad. <laughs> All right. Um, and uh, did someone write an inverse for this function? Yes. Yeah. How is a total function different from one to one? So the only thing that you need for a total function is that every value in the domain is mapped to something. It doesn't have to be one to one. It just has to go somewhere. So. So then, how is that different from injective? It's a good question. So let's say I have three values here and two values here. If I map these two, then it's surjective, but it's, it's a partial function because I haven't mapped this one to anything. To make it a total function, I have to map everything. <coughs> but I only have two elements in the codomain. So I can pick one to map to. And now it's total but it's not injective. It's surjective, right? But it's not one-to-one, -one, right? There are two arrows going here, so I can't go back the other way. I have a question here. Only if it's bijective. It has to be injective and surjective. If it's only injective, you can't necessarily go back. And that's 
because the inverse is basically a partial function, therefore it's not, is that the idea? Uh, I never thought of, that, thought of it that way, but I don't know if it's a partial function. Is it a partial it function? You map over, but then you Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're missing some, absurd. you're missing some data, or, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So in what lunch have been injected? As it is right now? Before, uh, no, well, before I think it's, uh, it's partial, so it's not injective. I think it was not injective or surjective, just uh, a partial function. It was injective, but not surjective. Yeah, I thought that was. I was like not, one of the elements was unmapped. Well, I guess, so. Saturday for, was not mapped. Yeah, Saturday is not mapped. But I guess for every element that is mapped, I don't know, I'm not really clear on actually the distinction. If you have a partial function and you're not mapping one element, does it still count as injective if every other element is mapped? Injective partial function. Injective partial function, okay. This is not something I think about because um, I don't think about partial functions other than that they're bad. <laughs> what type of function is always, oh, sorry, inverse, inverse of what lunch? What is the inverse of what lunch? Did someone come up with one? This should have been pretty straightforward. Yeah. Um, well, I did lunch to maybe day. You wanted to be extra clever? I mean, you could just write some function what day and just revert. So we're just reversing the arrows. Yeah. That's all you do when you write an inverse function is you reverse the arrows. And then I think the rest of it probably writes itself, right? You just have for each value in the codomain, you just flip them around and now you have that. So like I said, super trivial, but this is what this kind of thing looks like in, in Haskell. I, I think I originally promised to do something in JavaScript, but that was unpleasant. I think even if you don't know Haskell, uh, this should be pretty clear. It's like a nice notation for these kinds of ideas. What kind of function is always soup? Injective? Is it injective? Hmm? Did, oh, you seem to have one. A wireless mic? Yeah, this one. Oh, okay. Someone said, came up and said you needed one. I don't think so. Never mind. It's neither injective or surjective. But it is total. It's neither injective nor surjective, but it is total. Yeah, everything maps to soup. So it's not surjective, it's not injective. <clears throat> but it is total. It's not. And it's not certainly not an isomorphism. Um, I had some other exercises here. We're not going to do the, um, the identity proof one. But we do have a few other functions here. So what about, what about head, this function? This is from the Haskell prelude. What, what interesting things can we say about this function? Partial. Famously partial, right? Partial function, why? So. I think you could probably define some kind of set or category that has a special object that just attracts all arrows like this, like any, any bad values. Um, there's this idea of a pointed set where you get a special element, like a zero element, and you can just dump all of your errors there. Um, but in terms of um, like set theory or category theory, not category theory, this is, this is a partial function. Um, what about this and function? Actually, I have a better idea. You have friends now in the audience. Um, have a look at and and or. Determine whether there, what kind of functions are and and or. And um, see if you can write inverse functions for them, if there are any. That's like slightly more challenging. Is there an inverse function that you can write for and and or? Try that with your, uh, your new best friend. 